Want to advertise your business in a cost-effective way? It's time to give podcast advertising a try. Research shows a high rate of podcast listeners made a purchase as a result of an ad they heard on a podcast. Visit podbean.com slash brands to launch a cost-effective podcast advertising campaign in minutes. That's P-O-D-B-E-A-N dot com slash brands. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Breachside Broadcast, home of the finest fox casting either side of the breach. Today's story takes us deep into the wilderness that surrounds Malifaux. Those who venture into the wilds are either very brave or very foolish, for strange creatures lurk in the caves and forests and mountains, and the powers that rule the wildlands are stranger still. I hope you enjoy part one of Eat or Be Eaten. This episode of Breachside Broadcast is brought to you by Zachariah's Wilderness Tours. Zachariah is an experienced guide and outfitter who invites parties of adventurers to experience the majesty of the great outdoors. Walk through breathtaking scenery, camp under the starry sky, and get up close and personal with local wildlife. Please note that our insurance does not cover predation, savaging, mauling, goring, or decapitation. Eat or Be Eaten by Michael Wallace Bella screamed. Robert jolted upright from his seat at the dining table, spilling hot coffee across his undershirt. He hissed through the pain and stumbled out the back door, wiping himself off while he scanned the yard for his wife. Bella! he called out. The barn door stood open and the chickens had scattered. He cursed under his breath. It would take all morning to get them all back in their pen. He went to the barn, grumbling under his breath. What did you do? The barn was dark and appeared empty. Bella didn't answer him. And he couldn't see her. Bell? He asked as he squeezed out the coffee from the bottom of his shirt. You all right? One corner of the barn had been converted into a wall of trap nests. A chicken could enter the nest to lay an egg but couldn't leave until Bella or Robert let them out. Most of the cages had been opened, and a basket of eggs lay on its side nearby. Bell, Robert called out. Had she gone chasing after the chickens? Where was she? Sighing, he knelt down to pick up the basket, glad to see none of them had broken. He was surprised then, when the basket refused to budge. Confused, he picked up one of the eggs. It was warm and smooth to the touch, but as he pinched it, he realized it was solid. Not an egg. A stone. What the hell? A ragged gasp answered him. He whirled, suddenly alert. The stone egg dropped to the ground with a thud. Bell? He went to the horse pen and opened it. Holy God! Pomfrey, their workhorse, sat in one corner, curled up so tight he looked like he'd been crushed into a ball. The horse's fur, normally a splodged mix of white and brown, was a dull grey. Pomfrey was less a horse and more a boulder. A pained wheeze drew Robert's attention, and then he saw Bella. His wife was hunched behind the door, clutching her hand. Her body was stiff, 
Her breathing was shallow and desperate. To Robert's horror, he realized she was trying to breathe through lungs that were solidifying in her chest. One eye was stone and saw nothing, while the other stared right into Robert's, full of agony and fear. Tears rolled down her cheeks as they turned grey and ceased to move. Bella! No sound came from his wife, but her eyes shifted, widening as she spotted something just behind him. Robert whirled, seeing the shape crawling over the petrified palm tree. It was like some ugly mix of a crocodile and a chicken. Its body was spindly and emaciated, like a long-limbed dog, but it had a thick, paddle-like tail. Its forearms were membranous wings, and a blunt head that ended in a jagged black beak. Its scaly flesh was a dull green color, covered in patches of black and green feathers. The monster hissed, a deep-throated guttural noise. When its eyes met Robert's, they were the color of piercing amber that shimmered like polished glass. Robert felt his heart sink. He wept and cried out, and he nearly stumbled over Bella, who had nearly completely turned to stone at his feet. Blinded by tears, mindless in his panic, he scrambled over the horse-pen wall, using his own wife as a stepladder. The feathery horror snapped at his feet. He felt the metallic clang of its beak close to his foot as he leapt. He rushed across the barn floor on his hands and feet before he managed to break into a sprint toward the house. The rifle. It was where he'd left it, right next to the back door. He'd heard the hissing breath of a monster behind him, and the thump of its limbs galloping over the open ground. He'd never make it. Something hot and wet splattered against his back, scalding him hotter than the coffee. He let out a shallow scream as he tripped and smashed through the back door into a heap. He yanked his undershirt off, catching the acrid stench of the black tar-like substance that had hit him. He hurled the shirt aside, but the burning sensation remained. He slapped at his back, and found the skin had hardened like stone. He pulled his hand back, and saw his finger smeared with the sticky tar that sizzled against his flesh, and warped it stiff and grey. The monster let out a gurgling howl like a rooster trying to crow through a lungful of phlegm. It stalked back and forth content to wait while the petrifying substance did its work. The pain quickly spread across Robert's back. It wasn't like being stabbed or punched. It was a creeping numbness that left the untouched flesh twisting in pain before it too went numb. His screams continued as his entire hand solidified into a claw-like shape. He saw the rifle. A lever-action hog leg. He reached for it with his good hand, feeling his rapidly petrifying body weighing him down. It wasn't just the added weight from the parts of him that were now stone. The muscles he depended on for motion all his life suddenly didn't work. His shoulders refused to bend. His spine was locked in place. In another minute, he'd be too paralyzed to do anything but stare, just like Bella. He had to shove the barrel between his stone fingers to hold it steady but he worked the lever to chamber around. For a heartbeat, he considered putting the rifle to his own head, to end the pain and dread of inevitability. Instead, he snarled, aimed the rifle with one hand, and pulled the trigger. The monster didn't seem to realize what was happening until the bullet ripped through its chest and exploded out its back. Pain and rage lit up its eyes as blood pumped from the wound, and to Robert's surprise, it began to mix with the tar-like bile that had spat at him. Even as the creature twisted in agony, its own flesh began to petrify. Shrieking, the beast rolled and thrashed, smashing its own body to pieces. It died before Robert, and still its body continued to harden. Robert couldn't move, couldn't breathe. His heart no longer beat in his chest. But he managed a savage smile, and one last thought of his Bella before his world turned to stone. From his vantage on a hill overlooking the farm, Marcus watched the events play out, absently petting the jackalope curled up in his arm. When the only movements were nervous chickens pecking at the grass, Marcus set the jackalope down, took up his shillelagh, 
and hiked down to the farm, through the tall wheat. His senses were open to the world around him, the sway of the grass, the buzz of insects, and the smell of blood, coffee, and bitter cockatrice bile. He ignored the corpse of the beast and stood before the fallen farmer. To his surprise, the farmer had died with a victorious smile on his face. Marcus felt a pang of regret over his death. He had singled the couple out as just another pair of the guild's contract farmers, clawing away at his soil for their coin. But this one, despite his fear, had taken his killer down with him, like the deer that impales the wolf in its antlers, or the snake that bites the breast of the hawk. Marcus made a simple gesture of respect to the fallen farmer. You were no one's prey, he said with pride. He heard the panic calls of a chicken, turning just in time to see the jackalope drag a mound of bloody feathers back into the wheat to feed. His gaze fell upon the cockatrice, and his lips curled in disgust. Weak from the start, he muttered. He smashed the creature's stone head to pieces with one swing of his staff. His thoughts dwelled on the moment where he'd made the misstep in his creation as he prodded and spread the rocky shards. A fatal oversight. He shook his head. This was the fourth of such experiments, and again he was burdened with failure. Over the past months he had strived to perfect his hybrids, making use of the knowledge and resources sent to him by the Order of the Chimera. It was clear that there was still much to learn. His mind wandered, recalling his first meetings with the odd mages from Earthside. The Order had sought him out with a most intriguing offer to use Malifaux as a breeding and testing ground for their hybrids, to bring the monsters of Earth's myth back to life, if they ever existed in the first place. Marcus thought otherwise, but the possibility of creating such powerful beasts had been too tantalizing to ignore. Malifaux already existed in a strange state of nature as designed by the mages of Malifaux's ancient past, woven into being by the malevolent whims of the tyrants, or by those who fought them. What would occur, then, if Marcus changed that natural order in his own image, the image of Earth's myth? Which ecosystem would survive to dominate the other? An experiment of such size could reshape the world. His thoughts darkened as he stared at the failed cockatrice. He had missed a crucial component of the hybridization, immunity to its own petrifying bile. What good was its design when a single wound could slay it? He imagined the creature dying in the wilderness after suffering from an accident. A single scratch could kill it. No matter how impressive its abilities, it was too vulnerable to be considered anything but a failure. Marcus sat cross-legged next to the cockatrice, brooding. Perhaps there was hope for these simple animals free from domestication. They would know their place as prey, but perhaps they could survive. And yet... A coop full of chickens could endure where his own creations could not. Marcus' expression hardened into a frown. The jackalope reappeared, licking its teeth clean of blood. Something is missing, he said aloud. It was not a mere question of fixing an equation in his hybridization ritual. In fact, the more he thought about the structured scientific method of the Order's magic, the more he felt they were the problem. The natural world had no place for such things. It was about instinct and emotion, the evolutionary fluke that rose to dominate its kin. Much as he was hesitant to admit it, Marcus knew that he lacked insight. As ingrained as he was with the natural world, he was still a man, stymied by the human perspective. What he needed was a new perspective, one far from the trappings of men. At this thought, Marcus finally smiled. He put two fingers to his lips and whistled. After only a few minutes of waiting, a shape appeared in the northern sky. The giant creature, larger than Marcus, looked like a mix between a wolf and a hawk. It growled at him, unblinking eyes full of anger, but Marcus stared it down. It stalked toward him with cautious steps, hunched low and ready to pounce or fight. 
Marcus sniffed the air, smelling the fear and energy in its musk. He approached, fearless, making a low groaning noise that was almost a snarl. The beast hissed again, but did not back away. Though the fur was stiff on its back, it allowed Marcus to approach, and sniffed at him as he did. Marcus wove a simple spell into the air, amplifying the scent triggers that would compel its mind to understand his intentions. He had no need to beat it into submission, or control its thoughts. It would recognize his authority, or it would attack and he would slay it. After a few tense moments, the beast's posture relaxed and it bowed. He gripped the mane of its neck and pulled himself onto its back, and the creature took flight, soaring southward. As they flew, Marcus watched the arid brown of the Badlands steadily surrender to vibrant green foliage. Months ago, there would have been nothing but desert for miles around, but there were now vibrant forests, with trees tall and strong as though they'd been there for centuries. Plants of ancient Malifaux served as sanctuary and hunting grounds for animals that even Marcus had not encountered before, perhaps spawned from whatever font of power was feeding these new forests. He could feel that power in his blood and bones. It would take time to study, but perhaps here he could find the insights he lacked. He willed his mount to land, and it came to rest on the edge of a dense patch of woodland in one of the only areas where the nearly impenetrable canopy of leaves had parted. The creature's hackles were raised as it sniffed the air and maneuvered its large ears to take in every sound. Marcus mentally gave it thanks for its service and then dismissed it, watching it carefully to ensure it did not take the opportunity to strike at him. But the forest had left it far too wary, and it immediately took flight. Wise, Marcus thought. Another failed experiment, but not from its design, but rather its lack of discipline, a trait he had never fully managed to shake from the beast. He put the creature from his mind and turned to face the dense forest before him. He wondered if any human had come this far before, if any animal had encroached uninvited and lived to see the dawn. He had challenged many creatures for territory since coming to Malifaux, but he'd never had to challenge the territory itself before. Marcus noticed his thumb trembling as he gripped his shillelagh. He forced himself to be still, to make every movement a calculated one. The slightest hint of weakness, and every predator in the forest, and perhaps the forest itself, would have all the reason they needed to attack. Even if he were not so connected to the natural world, his human instincts would be screaming at him, He was being watched. He took a step forward into the forest. The brush fought him for every inch. Branches threatened to trip him. Honeypot creepers snapped their flytrap moors in his direction. Tree trunks seemed to press in on him from every side, and thorny vines promised to bite deep and expose the smell of his blood to the predators of the wood. He sensed malice in the air, and within the heavy shadows that lurked in every corner, but nothing malicious moved toward him. Marcus responded not with the audacity of an invasive human, cutting and stomping his way through the wilderness, but with the careful steps of a beast that welcomed and respected the forest as his hunting grounds and his equal. Each step was measured to avoid making noise, and he twisted his whole body to maneuver around bushes without disturbing them. He brushed the thorns only in one direction, ensuring they never caught on his skin or clothes. After only a few steps, the forest sensed that he was no intruder, and its resistance loosened. Although his expression remained stoic, Marcus was in awe. He had never felt a connection with the forest the way he had with the beasts of the wilderness. This place was primal, untainted. He yearned to test his ability to command it, but he reminded himself such abrasiveness would be considered a challenge by those who ruled here. Now was not yet the time to do that. Now was the time to study. He would adapt himself to this forest, as he had to the northern hills. 
he would continue his experiments in weaving the flesh of Malifaux's creatures. He would keep himself small and unimportant, for he knew there was another who called the Wildlands her territory, and she would not take kindly to his intrusion. Let her come, he decided. If she is strong, she will be rid of me. There is no other way. Content, Marcus made his way deeper into the woods. it for another episode of the Breachside Broadcast. Join us next time for the conclusion of Eat or Be Eaten. 